as we continue in our series of Lent leading up to Easter, we come to a scripture that is one of my favorites in the Bible. I guess you shouldn't have favorites. You know, it's like your children. You're not supposed to have favorites. But there are portions that just speak to me more than others. That's probably true for you as well. And every time this parable comes up, it is a joy to me and an eye-opening experience to dig into it once again. I always see things I haven't seen before. Relatively longer passage. When Janet put the bulletin together this week, we, we had to leave off the series graphic to get it to fit on the page. And you might notice that it goes kind of close to the margins. But there's really nothing to leave out in this story. In fact, there's a little bit more that we need to point to. Uh, what's in your bulletin, I and I don't actually have a bulletin in front of me right now. I don't think we have verses 1 through 3 on there, do we? starts in verse 11. We, we do. Okay, so she got it in there. Very good. You might notice that it goes from verse 3, or I guess verse 2, to verse 11. And so we'll mention what is in between there because really all of these parables hang together. It was just a little too much for us to read the whole thing this morning. So I'm going to, uh, as I sometimes do, uh, read from a different version. I'm going to read from the message because it just flows more like conversation. And you have the Common English Bible translation in front of you. So it says, by this time, a lot of men and women of questionable reputation were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. The Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased, not at all pleased. They growled. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. Their grumbling triggered this story. Now, the story that comes first after that, starting in verse 4, is the story of the shepherd with a hundred sheep and one was lost. And how, we, how the uh, shepherd would seek the one that was lost. And then we have in verses 8 through 10 the story of the lost coin. And I can relate to that one. You know, when you've got Literally, you have money, it's in the checking account, but you realize there's a $10 bill somewhere that you've lost track of. You go looking for that thing, don't you? And so Jesus is relating these everyday experiences to these folks. And then he comes to the parable that most of us know as uh, the parable of the prodigal son. But you might notice from the passage that it goes well beyond that. I think it's more accurate to call this the parable of the two sons. And so let's see if this familiar story can be brought to us afresh today. Then he said, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all through that country, and he began to feel it. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. And every time I read this part, I get 
emotional. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him, his heart pounding. He ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants, quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a prize-winning heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time, his older son was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in. As he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling over one of the houseboys, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stomped off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, Look how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief. But have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then this son of yours, who has thrown away your money on whores, shows up, and you go all out with a feast. His father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time, and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time, and we had to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead, and he's alive. He was lost and found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's just so much, so much in this. I'll start with a little thing. Down towards the end of this, you might notice that the older brother, in talking to his father about what he's upset about, says, then this son of yours... Stop right there. He's not even acknowledging him as a brother this son of yours. Now, anybody who's ever raised children, you know this one. I can think of how many times Janet has said to me something about, your son has done thus and such. Your daughter. (laughs) And we understand the tone there, don't we? And notice how the father responds. This brother of yours was dead. You heard the uh, letter from the delegation as we read it in the announcements this morning. To me, one of the most painful aspects of the challenges that we face these days is people accusing each other of being unfaithful, not loving the Bible, judging who's in the family and who's not. In fact, as we look at this whole story, you understand that it started up there in verses 1 through 3. Jesus was hanging around a lot of people of questionable reputation, and the Pharisees and religion scholars were not pleased. He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. And one of the most convicting things as I look at this story is to ask myself within the story, which of these two am I likeliest to be? Do I get upset when I see somebody else receiving something and I think it's not fair? How often have we said that phrase, it's not fair? It's almost always in regard to what somebody else is getting, is it not? That's a bit sobering to think about in terms of my own behavior. I don't know about you. 
One of the things that is so amazing here, the song, Amazing Grace, the psalm that we read, where David says, I, I tried to hide, but then I realized I just needed to open myself up to you. The picture of the father who when he was when the son was still a long way off, his father saw him, he was watching for him. There's so much love in this story. There's love on both sides of it. Certainly there's love in welcoming the son back, but have you thought about the love that was involved in what happened at the beginning? Remember that we are talking about Jewish culture here. If we look into the Old Testament, we can see that in such a situation, the older son on the death of the father would be entitled to two-thirds of the estate. The younger son, one-third. He would have been well within his rights to say, you've got to wait till I die, son. You're not getting anything. If you want to go away, that's up to you. But you're not getting anything. The father didn't do that, didn't try to stop him either. That too was love. And because a lot of us have been in similar circumstances, when we look at things that we know our children are doing, that they will regret. And yet, how often have we said, you can't tell them anything? And how do we know that? Because you couldn't tell me anything either. There are things we have to learn the hard way, aren't there? I know you all have heard me tell the story about my oldest son. It's been a little over four years since he died. But I had a conversation with him once along these lines. Wasn't taking care of himself. He, he really, at the time, he wasn't accepting the fact that he was diabetic and in renal failure. Other things that he was doing that was just kind of stupid. Anybody else would look at it and say it's stupid. And I said, son, there are three kinds of people in the world. There are people who learn the easy way. There are people who learn the hard way, and there are people who just don't learn. Now, you have already proven you're not the first kind. It remains to be seen which of the other two you are. And I'm pleased to say that he did learn. He learned the hard way. He learned from life. He didn't learn in time, but he was making so much progress there just before his death. I think as we look at these two sons, we see that the first son was that second type. He learned the hard way, but he learned. The other son didn't even know he had something to learn. You might also notice that the father was not just trying to recover the prodigal son. He was trying to reach both sons. It's just that one recognized the need and one did not. What are our circumstances? Are we so certain that we're right that we feel no need for the grace of God? I have to mention, I guess as a kind of a side note, as Jesus told this story, I'm sure you remember this, but we just need to point it out. When he's in this foreign country, he got assigned to the fields to slop the pigs, and you know to a faithful Jew that this was horrible. Pigs being such unclean animals under the Old Testament law. Reminds me of uh, a friend of mine, a, uh, a Baptist preacher, who told me a religious truth. He said, let me see if I get it right here. He said that uh, our Jewish friends do not recognize Jesus as the Savior. Our Protestant friends do not recognize the Pope as authoritative and two Baptists do not recognize each other in a liquor store. And this recognition thing, you see, and uh, 
which uh, I had some friends in our neighborhood who were of Jew Jewish heritage. I noticed my Baptist friends would sneak around and buy liquor. I kid you not, they snuck around and bought ham. The for whatever is forbidden, you see. And in context, this young man wound up because of his, his choices in a situation that was completely wrong for him. But he recognized it. This translation says he came to his senses. A lot of translations say he came to himself. In Wesleyan theology, this is what we would call prevenient grace. God gives us the opportunities to see. He doesn't force, but he opens himself up. May we have the humility and the openness to spirit to recognize our need to come to the Father. Would you bow with me? Father, it is difficult to put into words how grateful we are for your openness that you watch for us, Father. That you give us the freedom to make our own choices and you long for us to come to you. Help us, Father, to be open to that. Open us to Holy Spirit. And let us, Father, as we might find ourselves inside the household, let us welcome those who are maybe outside right now, who may be different from us, who may look at things differently from us, but are our brothers and sisters, Father. Help us to join in the celebration we ask these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.